welcome to this week's Mountain West ADC Echo. My name is Brian Wood, Medical Director, and I will turn it over to today's speaker. Brian, thank you. Well, today's topic is acute HIV infection, and I hope I'm going to leave you with the feeling that it's very important to know more about acute HIV and to be able to diagnose acute HIV. Uh, the four areas that I'm going to dive into are going to be transmission events that occur at the time of acute HIV. Secondly, the clinical manifestations, just a very brief description of that. Third, what you need to do to be able to diagnose acute HIV. And last, what are the current recommendations and the most recent guidelines related to treatment of acute HIV in individuals and why you should really jump in and treat people with acute HIV. First of all, the basic transmission events I think are very important for us to understand more about in terms of the pathophysiology and to understand prevention of HIV. So first of all, the concept to understand is that when an individual is living with HIV and they don't have suppressed HIV RNA levels, they really have a quasi-species of virus that exists inside of their body. There are multiple different strains of HIV. And when a sexual exposure occurs, there's multiple of these quasi-species that actually are exposed to another individual who's on the receiving end of this. It's very interesting that even though there are these multiple quasi-species that are exposed, there's usually only one, maybe two virions that has essentially all the capable factors that lead to transmission. And we call this capable or transmittable virus the so-called founder or transmitter virus. And this is a very important concept in the prevention world. So if you take a look more at sort of the cellular level, and we're, we're really looking now here at what it would look like at the mucosal level and, and a sexual transmission, again, HIV is going to come in and have contact with this mucosal layer, and then you look at the targets below the epithelial cells, the dendritic cells, CD4 cells, and macrophages, and the concept, again, is that even though you have all these quasi-species that are there, there's essentially only one virion, the so-called founder virus, that has all the capable factors that lead to transmission. Almost always, the transmitter virus is so-called R5 tropic virus, and the cells that it infects are usually CD4 cells entering through the CCR5 uh, pathway. Now, the very early events are called the prime infection. This occurs essentially on day one for there's very limited replication of the virus. It may be within a single uh, transmitted cell, the CD4 cell, but there also could be very limited to a few adjacent cells. By day two or four, what you start to see is a little ex local expansion across some of the CD4 cells that are in the vicinity. And what can really change the dynamics is if some of these CD4s become activated, as shown by that one with the yellow halo. And this really leads to an uptick in the pace of the actual viral replication. By day three to seven, you start to see local dissemination to local lymph nodes, and this is facilitated by transmission of the virus from CD4 cells by dendritic cells. And again, once you start to see spread into the lymph nodes, essentially this event is beyond being able to contain at this point, and you really have clear-cut transmission of HIV. By day seven, you start to see some spillover of the virus into the blood. It may be at such low levels, it's not detectable at this point, but you start to see very, very low level viremia at this point. And this is showing you graphically sort of how the virus ramps up. And this is showing you on a log scale HIV RNA levels. And you can see that the virus tends to start ramping up after day five. It typically becomes detectable around day 10 to 12. And then there's a very rapid ramp up, especially if you consider this is log scale to very high levels of virus, often up in the million range within a month after the actual acquisition of the virus. So let me shift now to briefly discuss the clinical manifestations. And I think most of you are probably very familiar with this, but I do want to underscore the challenge of diagnosing someone with acute HIV because the clinical manifestations are so nonspecific. So this is a graph from, from uh, about 160 individuals that were diagnosed with acute HIV, and you can see a very nonspecific list of symptoms that were common, fever, lethargy, myalgias, rash, headache. So for a clinician to, to pick this out and diagnose acute HIV would be very difficult 
unless they knew there had been a recent exposure to HIV. And what we need to train clinicians, and, and when you're teaching to other individuals, make sure they understand that these symptoms almost always begin within a month after the person has had an exposure to HIV. So the, the symptoms, if you can tie them in with the recent exposure, it helps a great deal. I tend to think of this as a mononucleosis-like like illness. A lot of people describe it as a flu-like illness or mononucleosis-like illness. If you have a rash, that also will help you in, in drilling down to think about acute HIV. The rash, if you see it, looks somewhat like a syphilis rash or a measles rash, and, and it's very nonspecific, could look like a drug eruption. But again, the key thing is to tie in the recent exposure with a mononucleosis-like illness, perhaps with a rash, uh, and that clinically may help you to think about acute HIV. In terms of the laboratory diagnosis of HIV, this is where it can be a little bit confusing and a little bit tricky. As I showed you a little bit earlier, there's a period where the virus is essentially not detectable. And if there are no markers that we have that we can use to test for the virus, there's a period that we call the eclipse phase, which is the time after infection when no existing diagnostic test is capable of actually detecting HIV. So this individual could be infected, but we don't have the capability with standard commercially available assays to detect this. And I tend to think of this as that the eclipse phase is the infection to detection phase. That's the way to think about it. Now there's also a terminology used called the seroconversion window period. This terminology was really generated predominantly when we just had antibody testing used for HIV. And the seroconversion window really describes the time period from acquisition until conventional HIV antibody tests turn positive. And this is usually about day 25 with, with the current IgM, IgG sensitive antibody assays. Now, if you introduce P24 antigen testing, which we do now in our regular screening, you can see from this graphic, which is showing you the timing of HIV RNA positivity, HIV P24 antigen positivity, the green line, and then HIV antibody test positivity, you can see that the if you are introducing P24 antigen, you, you can reduce that time period of detection of HIV from about 25 to 26 days down more in the 17-day range. So that is one of the reasons now that HIV antigen antibody testing has become routine. It's to try and shorten this period when conventional testing would not detect HIV. Just to remind everybody what HIV P24 antigen is, the P24 antigen is the protein that forms the viral shell of the capsid. So this is essentially the, the core of the virus where much of the sort of the internal key proteins and in, in, in RNA of the virus are inside of the viral core. And the P24 antigen is just the protein that lines this. So it's an abundant protein in HIV, and that's one of the reasons that it's chosen uh, as, a, as a common assay. And one of the things that's good to get a perspective on is when people present with acute illness, when does this usually match up with what their serologic testing and their viral load testing would show? So typically, if an individual presents with acute HIV, the typical pattern laboratory-wise would be a very high viral load. Often it could be 800,000, a million, two million. Usually the P24 antigen test should be positive, and usually the antibody test using conventional IgM, IgG assays is going to be negative. So that's the typical pattern in someone presenting with a clinical illness of acute HIV. Now, as all of you are familiar with, we now use this sort of standard CDC, Association of Public Health Laboratories, algorithm for our routine HIV testing. So if you look at this algorithm, the question is, what would you typically get with somebody with acute HIV? So the initial screening test with the antigen antibody test, as I said, is typically positive. But when you go on to do your HIV-1-2 differentiation immunoassay, that is just an antibody test, IgM and IgG, but there's no P24 detection in that, that test usually is negative. So then, if you have in the algorithm, if that test is negative, you should do a nucleic acid test, typically an HIV RNA level, and that test should be positive. So the classic pattern with acute HIV using this testing algorithm, positive screening test, negative differentiation assay, 
positive viral load test. And that's the classic pattern that would suggest and should make you think about acute HIV. Conceptually, a lot of people like to look at this more linearly and think about the different tests we use and how they lay out in terms of turning positive. As I said before, the viral load pretty reliably is positive by day 12 or 13 and often positive by day 10. The green is showing you the antigen antibody, P24 P antibody test, but notice one key point in this. The point of care antigen antibody test, if you're using, is not quite as early in detection as the laboratory-based antigen antibody test. It's about three to five days later. It's an important point. If you're using conventional EIA testing or antibody testing, conventional uh, IgM, IgM, IgG uh, laboratory-based test, you can see that turns positive significantly earlier than with point-of-care test, and, and that's a key point for people that are using uh, point-of-care testing in, in settings where it's, it's indicated, where individuals may not be coming back and getting the results of their test. Last, the older test that we use, the Western blot, clearly is the last to turn positive, and it can be delayed even out much longer than I've shown here. Now, this was a test that was recently published that drilled down a little bit to look at thinking about what percentage of people would have a positive P24 antigen after HIV acquisition. What this graphic is showing you on the y-axis is the percentage of people who have a positive test. The x-axis is showing you the duration as the after the days of acquisition. So what this is showing is that 25% of people would have a positive test by day 13. Approximately 50% of people would have a positive test on day 18. By day 23.6, 75%, and at day 44, essentially 100% of people, or 99%, should have a positive HIV antigen uh, antibody assay. So this is where the term window period comes in with this test, and the CDC defines this basically to say that using the HIV antigen antibody test, you can essentially rule out people after 45 days that their test should be positive. That is your window period where you can say you've closed that and the individual does not have acute HIV. The last point to make about diagnostic testing is you may actually be testing somebody on a routine basis and pick them up even before um, they have a clinical illness or what we call very early acute HIV. In this scenario, as shown here, you could have a positive viral load, a negative P24 antigen, and a negative antibody test. So to emphasize, if you were to see someone in a clinical setting and you highly suspected that they had acute HIV and your initial screening test was negative, the correct thing to do at that point would be to go ahead and directly order an HIV RNA test. That's an unusual scenario, but it is a possible scenario, and that's the only way that you effectively could rule out acute HIV is if you did a nucleic acid test at that point. Last, let me finish with treatment. So there's a very strong rationale to treat all persons with acute HIV, and the question is why? Well, first of all, you want to prevent disease transmission, I mean, disease progression in these individuals. Jumping in very early is the single biggest thing you can do to be able to minimize the amount of lymphoid damage, especially gut-associated lymphoid tissue damage. Secondly, you are going to minimize the seeding of sanctuary sites throughout the body. And although that may not seem relevant now, if subsequently, years from now, we have pharmacological mechanisms to cure people, it could turn out that the degree of viral inf infection in sanctuary sites may turn out to be a predictor of, of who could be cured with pharmacological therapy. Third and last, but not least, is we want to prevent forward transmission of HIV from these individuals. We know that people with acute HIV are very high risk of transmitting to others. We often call them super transmitters for the following reasons. Number one, they're unaware of their HIV status. Number two, they have a very high viral load. And number three, we know that they just got essentially the right stuff founder virus that early on in their infection, that is going to be the, the predominant virus that's circulating in their body. So they have homogeneity of transmission-capable viral variants. And last, very early on, you have very low titers of neutralizing antibodies, which later may help minimize or reduce transmission slightly. So the last point to get into is what will we actually use to treat people at this phase? So this is an example, 23-year-old man's diagnosed with acute HIV with a viral load of 324,000, a genotype, uh, drug resistance test is ordered, and the question to think about 
is can you start antiretroviral therapy before the genotype result returns? And secondly, if you're going to start antiretroviral therapy, what should you use? <coughs> so here are the five points about treating individuals with acute HIV. First of all, and to underscore again, everyone should be treated with acute HIV. Secondly, you've got to order a genotypic drug resistance test before you start treatment, because once you start in, you're going to lose that opportunity to see what the virus looked like that was transmitted to them. Third, it is totally fine to initiate antiretroviral therapy before the resistant results are available if you use a recommended regimen. The recommended regimens should have an anchor drug with a very high genetic barrier resistance, and the anchor drugs recommended in the DHHS guidelines are boosted darunavir or dolutegravir, and then you combine them with TAF-FTC or TDF-FTC. A bacavir 3 tc should not be used in a backbone with acute HIV. Probably Bictegravir, TAF, FTC would be totally fine, but it has not made it into the guidelines last. And, and last, if you get a resistance that pops up on the genotype and you need to modify therapy, absolutely that's fine to do. So you want to track and monitor the, the genotype. So let me finish there, but I want to underscore three key points. So first of all, number one, it's really important to be able to make a diagnosis of acute HIV. Secondly, don't wait to start therapy. These are individuals at extremely high priority to jump in and get on therapy right away. Third key point is if you're going to jump in and you don't have your genotypic drug resistance test, make sure and use either a boosted darunavir regimen or a dolutegravir based regimen. Thank you for watching this edition of the Mountain West HIV Project Echo Didactic Series. If you're interested in other talks, we invite you to subscribe to this YouTube channel. You can select the red subscribe button. You can also find additional talks by searching YouTube for MWATC Project Echo. Until next week's edition, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director, signing off.